Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. You are watching the state of the state of Hawaii on Monday, September 27th, 2021. I'm your host for the show, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our topic today is the Eurasian Center. This non-government organizational organization builds positive relations cultural understandings and promotes economic development um, among the nations of America, Europe, and Asia. As we know, Hawaii is geographically located in the middle of Eurasia and has natural interest in uh, this organization's transactions and, uh, and presumably more some potential for more participation in its initiatives. The Eurasian Center's educational outreach also uh, may be a resource for Hawaii's aims to diversify and strengthen its economy and uh, support America's global participation. Now, our guest today is from the Eurasian Center, um, uh, an officer of the organization, and um, his name is Ralph E. Winnie Jr. He is vice president of Global Business Development for the Eurasian Business Coalition and Director of China, the China Project in the Eurasian Center. He is also a partner here um, in Washington, D.C. of Henson, Pang and Winnie Law Firm, International Law Firm, which is also um, located in Shanghai, China. So more, more importantly, Ralph is a local boy <laughs> and he, a former wrestler on a winning Punahou team back in the day. So uh, well, welcome, Ralph, to, to the program. Thank so, you, Stephanie. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Well, yeah, you know, right. I'm going uh, to start by asking you just to talk a little bit about what is the Eurasia Center and uh, your role in it and then maybe the mission too. So if you could just make it clear what you all do. Yeah, the Eurasia Center was founded in 1987 by Dr. Gerard Janko, one of Gorbachev's energy ministers and a Soviet dissident as a way to promote people to people exchanges, relationship building uh, during the time of perestroika and, and Glasnost. Um, around the time of um, Mikhail Gorbachev's reign as president of Russia, and he was looking to do out outreach to uh, improve the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. So the Eurasia Center was formed as a center for Soviet American relations um, as a way to promote people to people exchanges and relationship building. And then after the fall of the Soviet Union in 91, the name was changed to Eurasia to um, incorporate the former Soviet bloc countries, and Europe and Asia. I was brought on board to handle China. I had spent um, about a year and a half studying in Russia at Moscow State University, and um, I learned the language, and I studied law and business there, and then um, worked um, in Washington, D.C. for a boutique trade law firm that I re a rep office in China. Um, which took me to China quite often. And Dr. Jenko asked me to come on board and help develop you know, our China programs as a way to bridge the divide between the US and China that was starting you know, in um, the late 90s into the 2000s. Um, what our center tries to do is to not only publish scholarly work, um, but to create an environment where people can come together and um, create positive discourse and dialogue um, and to break down cultural religious barriers so people can feel comfortable engaging and promoting their ideas um, in a, in a um, positive environment. And we look at our role as a bridge to create um, public partnerships um, between the US, China, Russia, and Central Asia um, and develop personal and professional relationships that is going to lead to positive discourse, not only on the political, but on the business side as well. And we, and having been born and raised in Hawaii, you know, I really take those values to heart when I'm engaging 
you know, with people in, in China, Russia, Central Asia, um, who have a very positive impression of Hawaii, but not necessarily of the United States per se, and trying to impart, you know, what a wonderful country U.S. is and how exceptional our country is. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very inspired by Reagan's, you know, um, belief that the U.S. was that shining city on the hill where people would come and escape political religious oppression and be able to come. And if you worked hard, you could make make your mark. Mm -hmm. And I believe that my role with the Eurasia Center is to really help and grow and develop these relationships, not only on a personal, but on a professional level and create long lasting relationships. And our center has done things, not only like art exhibitions, we brought the balalaika performers over, we've done Japanese sushi parties, we've done, um, I did a, I was an MC for a fashion show. And um, we also do various conferences focused on um, the Silk Road Initiative, US and China, US and Russia, um, and, and uh, global business development um, to grow and promote small and medium-sized businesses. We love to work with delegations that come over from Russia, China, and Central Asia um, who are looking for potential business partners. That's very rewarding for me, personally. Yeah, can, yeah now I know that you, you are not the first organization or initiative to, to do this kind of, uh, outreach are you from um the u.s or um are you i mean in other words that that's a very striking arrangement that that dr janko uh per, 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 right he had a vision yeah to really have the eurasia center make its mark you know not only within the united states but globally as a way to bring people together if you grew up during the Cold War, you remember the tensions that existed, especially with the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the situation in it with Afghanistan, you know, the downing of the Korean airliner. Um, and tensions were very, very high. And one of the ways that you could break down those barriers was to focus on culture and the arts. As a former wrestler, I bring that perspective being with my involvement with the US Wrestling Foundation um, which took me to Cuba. And one thing that I learned from being in Cuba is that wrestling is popular in places where the United States is not. And when Americans go over there representing the US wrestling team, they are treated with the utmost respect. They're treated as honored guests. Um, and it allows us to really impart the values of the United States um, to help develop and promote relationships at that personal level that the government of those of a country like Cuba will recognize. You know, Iran is another country. Um, it, if you remember when the US wrestling team went to Iran for the World Cup, they were the most popular team. They would, when they arrived at the airport, I kid you not, they were moved to the front of the line to go through customs, except they couldn't go through customs right away because all the customs agents wanted their pictures taken and, and to share their stories with the wrestlers and the coaches. Yeah. And yeah, um, it's this kind of bonding that you wouldn't that. normally expect. And our center is really at the focus of trying to break down, you know, the governmental, religious and uh, barriers mm -hmm. that really are a threat to creating global peace, harmony and bridge building which is really important. Well, so as you, um, it seems like your work, you're coming at it from a number of different levels. So this bottom up thing with the relationship development and the youth and the athletes and all those places that it's easy to relate across cultures and national barriers. Yes. And then you're coming in also above that with business ventures and that. Has, so how do you roll all this up that might have a, possibility of affecting the ethos or the the well you well you start at that you start at the personal level i always say when when i go to china the the very first meeting that you have with the chinese is key they're checking you out to see if you're someone that they can do business with so that very first meeting you're not talking about business you're getting to know each other you know and you're 
um, talking about your friends and your family and um, what your what your hobbies are, you know, and everyone is trying to get comfortable with each other. Do you find once you do that, then you can take it to the next level Mm -hmm. because the Chinese, like the Russians, like the Iranians, they're taught to be very wary of foreigners. And you have to get over that mindset, that mentality, and be able to move to the next level as a respected and trusted friend and partner in order to be able to do the business deal. So do you find that America is a little less friend, friendly or competent on that making that personal contact? I mean, that's what I've noticed every time is that, yes, the other, the other countries and the other people socialize at that personal level a lot initially. And for those uh, points that you made to find out who you are and what you do and what kind of person you are and what your interests are and kind of like assessing, you know, what, what is, what are you here for and what are your values? Right. But, and, and, and I find that maybe America doesn't spend that much time on that business that entry is that is that an issue well i think having grown up in in a mix of asian you know western um civilization if you want to for a better word um i understand how important that personal relationship is whereas if you come to the mainland you know it's may all be about the contract it just depends on the Mm -hmm. situation that you're in the cards that you're dealt with But Mm -hmm. I always feel no matter what situation you're in, try and develop a personal rapport with the person on the other side of the table. Don't lecture them. Don't uh, presume to to think that you know everything about them. Listen, be a very good listener and Mm -hmm. hear what they're saying. And that's what I would have told Tony Blinken. I mean, when he went in and lectured the Chinese, you can't do that. You've got to be respectful. You've got to listen. You have to stand your ground on certain things, but don't go in and let, start lecturing people if you don't have a personal relationship with them. So, and, so the Secretary of State did lecture them. Are you referring to what was a televised uh, readout of his? When they, yeah, when when the American delegation showed up in Ang- in Alaska, the Chinese perceived as they were being lectured by the U.S. side. You know, um, when we have issues that the Chinese would say in our country that we need to address, you know, when there are riots in the streets based on racial inequality, Mm -hmm. um, you know, then we're going out and and telling other countries how to do things. That's how it was perceived. Um, Now, I do think if you look at our system, where people have stood up and fought, whether it's the civil rights workers from the 60s, they worked within the system using the media, using the courts to be able to affect positive change. And that's what we show, and we should be continuing to show the world that if you work within the system, um, that you can affect the change that you're looking for. Um, That you don't need a physical, revolution like exist in other countries but you can work within the system to affect positive change so what can you give some examples of what working within the system is so you're talking about the system of the other of the other party right out of your own system what does that really mean in well when we go to china we take clients over you know we always we encourage them to work with a trusted partner on the ground that can help them navigate the system, legal, political, and regulatory, to be able to get their project completed uh, and to be able to register their patents under Chinese law. We can point to the successful outcome of Michael Jordan's lawsuit um, when his Air Jordan shoes were being um, compromised by a Chinese competitor. He, what he did is he, he hired a Chinese law firm and a Chinese media firm to take up his case and then won. We look to the example of Singapore and Chinese that have won their cases in Chinese court. This is not to say this is easy to do business in China, but you have to be able to do it the right way. And that's why you know, we have a very strong law firm, IPO paying 
Shinku law that's on the ground that helps clients um, every step of the way to get established, you know, in China and to be able to know that they're in good hands when they come, that they will have a, a trusted, uh, viable partner and they'll be helped to the legal, regulatory and political um, situation that they'll have to deal with. And conversely, when you have Chinese and Russian companies and Central Asian companies coming to the US, they've got to feel like the system here is transparent so that they can be able to navigate the system, um, both on the political, legal and regulatory. And that's always a challenge because of the different mindset and culture. But that's something that we at the Eurasia Center really strive for, um, to be able to help get everybody acclimated and to understanding how things are, are done here in the United States. So are you talking also about what, what it is to work within a situation of political risk? Because I know you all talk about bringing um, uh, an understanding developing an understanding of the political risk and what, what that context right. is. You are the only ones who really um, went gone, gone with that, that trying to- Well, political risk is important. You want everybody to realize that when they come to the United States, that there are gonna be challenges that are gonna have to be overcome on the legal, regulatory and political side and be able to prepare them appropriately even before they come, but once they're here on the ground, be able to think on your feet, to be able to help them navigate through the system um, with you know, a transparent um, legal regulatory system that's in place. And um, that's what we strive to do at the Eurasia Center. Um, not only working on the personal and professional level, but making sure that um, the people achieve, you know, the results that they're looking for. It's very challenging right now because of COVID, ha having to do everything over Zoom and you cannot meet face-to-face, -face, press the flesh and shake hands, mm -hmm. you know, for perfectly logical health reasons. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, people have got to be mm -hmm. able to come together, sit down, talk and engage personally and professionally in order to get, you know, things accomplished. Well, when, when, okay, uh, those are definitely impediments, but, but presumably they're temporary and uh, yes, yeah, presumably and get back um, to having the advantages of all of this momentum right. achieved through the personal yeah. relationship. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that when do you start bumping up against totalitarianism or, or communism? When do you start to bump up against that? How, how do you, how have you all learned or what do you all do about that encounter? Well, you have to know how to engage at the highest level. You have to have the right people in place that have the ear of a particular government that can vouch for your bona fides, your credentials. And you have to be a very strong and powerful voice in terms of promoting your position. In many of these Central Asian countries like Russia and China, you advance by being strong you know, physically, politically, and emotionally. You've got to be perceived as being strong. And, and having a wrestling background is very important because many of their former wrestlers, weightlifters, they all go into a profession uh, where they are considered strong, powerful, respected people. So you have to have that position of engaging from a position of strength not from a position of weakness. And that's where the US is going to have to look towards showing they're engaging from a position of strength. That is gonna be the key to achieving long lasting economic success and prosperity. And that's what Reagan saw. That's what Reagan pushed to do after he took over from Carter was creating a, an America that led, led by example, that was strong and powerful um, and that helps their their fellow man. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, it, it's still a matter of uh, then, um, yeah, getting strong. And so, okay, so everybody's working um, uh, 
off of a of a of a powerful a power base or a strength of their own the most the strongest they can be and then getting in when it gets into um the hong kong situation or what in china i mean it just seems i think that's such an interesting example where you're talking about having so much momentum there but i mean that is one of the toughest places right now to come up against the differences in the systems that that well the the, the business community will have a strong role to play in what kind of um, relationship they want to have with mainland China. Um, how are they going to engage? How are they going to do business in within uh, New Hong Kong? So I think it's important for the business community um, to stand up and to lay out how they want to be able to engage moving forward in Hong Kong. That will put the Chinese on notice as to what the Western global corporate elites, if you want to say, use that term, think and how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. Once, you know, so the global business community certainly has a strong role to play in the kind of system that they would like to see in place in Hong Kong. And they need to communicate that effectively, not only to the Chinese government, but also to um, the U.S. government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I and so that is, and that is something that you all advise and consult on, right? This the Eurasia Center, because people don't come like you're talking about Tony Blinken. I mean that that that's just so disappointing to hear. You know that that he came at it in a way that might not have been uh, simpatico with them, and you know which just gets you in trouble right out the gate, right? But hopefully um, he'll be able to correct on that, and especially. Sure. It's right for the good of the United States, absolutely. Because that's what you're going for is to get. Right. So that was one of my questions: is where where is all of this going? Where does the Eurasia and the big big picture coming um, out at the end, where we, we, you've achieved all you can achieve? What what will that look like? Um, what I think is, you're going to have to create a system where there's free, free flow of goods, trades, and services. We have appropriate trade rules and barriers in place, but at the same time, you have a viable global economy where people can engage on a personal and professional level to um, get things accomplished. You know, Trump, whatever you wanna say about him, he's not a politician or a diplomat, he was a deal maker. So what can you do for me? And that was his goal was to make the art of the deal, to make deals like he had with Mexico to keep um, these migrants in the country while they were filing their asylum claims. Um, who would have thought that he would have been able to orchestrate such an agreement with the nation of Mexico? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we need, every country needs an influx of new immigrants. If you don't have that, your society is going to vanish and evaporate. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you cannot allow your borders to be to be overrun with people that could be, you know, uh, could have nefarious intentions. So you have to maintain that balance. You have to have the rule of law respected. Um, you have to have a level of compassion and empathy for people that are escaping a horrific, a horrific past, horrific situation, and are coming here for a better life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what we have to strive for is the right balance and ensuring that we are moving forward, um, promoting the United States as the bastion of free market democracy and to promote economic trade and development um, so, so that we can grow and lead the world in a very positive way. We would like to get back to doing that again. Yeah. But what now? Your level. You work at the level of the nation, right? At, at the nation level, or I mean, that's that's your connect, right? At that that level, is that is that how it goes? We work with all different stakeholders. It could be um, small business. It could be corporations. It could be people in government. It could be sportsmen. Um, you know, it just depends on who engages with us at any given time. And you have to be comfortable at all levels. 
and you have to know and understand what people are looking for. That's why I say you have to be a very good listener. That way you can understand what is on people's mind, what is going to help, what uh, what is going to help them, what can you do to help them, you know, achieve their goal. So in the case of the state of Hawaii, um, yes. can, can it get from, from a resource such as you all are and all international, can, can it strive to make a connection that would be uh, working together with you all on doing things for itself that gets it, its economy strengthened and diversified and get, and, which contributes to the U.S. being um, more sure. connected? So what, what would that look like? That could be out of the government if somebody wanted well, to. Well, as you know, in Hawaii, everything is relationship based. Mm -hmm. The trust and respect that, that people have. Um, you have to start at the very basic level and develop those connections through the personal familial network into the state government and being able to have trusted allies, partners in state government that are going to be open-minded to any kind of plan that you put forth, you know, mm -hmm. to grow and develop the state of Hawaii, because they're very in, in, entrenched um, networks of people. Um, and Hawaii does things their own way. They don't like to be told how to do things. So mm -hmm. you have to have that degree of respect and trust um, when you're proposing mm -hmm. um, something before people will come around and support and endorse it. Mm -hmm. Well, I but just certainly the, Hawaii has a tremendous amount of opportunity um, working with various stakeholders um, in the public and the private sector. And we need to look at, you know, um, bringing in more delegations from China, Japan, Russia, Central Asia. And I think um, when they loosen the restrictions, on quarantine, I think it will be a boon, you know, to Hawaii. If you can get more of these tours coming over where people come on vacation, but then open it up where they're able to be exposed to potential business opportunities um, that would help grow small business in the state of Hawaii. Because Absolutely. that's the engine of growth is small business. And they're the ones that are hurting right now. So we've got to create new markets of opportunity for small business in Hawaii. Exactly. So that that small business um, uh, level is really important to em, em, embrace and, yes. and to build up. So and and so is that maybe going to happen? Or people are where's the, in, the incentive for that going to come from? How, how does that start happening? People watch this program and think about, hey, well, this is a way to get started. But what 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 can happen? Well, I hope people are watching this program and will call in with ideas. Um, right now, so many businesses have shuttered. People have moved to the mainland because of the lockdown. Yeah. Um, so what we have to do is focus on bringing um, people from other, other states, other countries, bringing new market share, new ideas, new business opportunities to the state of Hawaii, mm -hmm. where you know, we can help grow and develop small business, working with our allies in the state government, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a way that's respectful to the state um, and recognizes uh, Ohana, recognizes um, the important contributions of the Hawaiian people and the land. All of this has to be taken into account, you know, when someone that's a foreigner comes to the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. This is so true. Well, you know it well and have stated it as it as it needs to be. And hopefully we will be able to to go that way and uh, make a difference. I, I know there are many ideas about how to diversify and uh, strengthen this economy. And uh, we need all of them. And uh, hopefully uh, we can use um, some influences such as you all bring to it to, to help. I think... Um, we're getting close to um, wrap up time. So I wanted to say, is there any final comment that you'd like to make um, about the Eurasia Center and its work here in this program? I'm, I'm just very um, excited about things moving forward. I think once we bring this virus under control, 
you're going to see the you're going to see everybody want to get out and engage and look for opportunities to grow and develop not only on a personal level but their business um, mm -hmm. nobody likes to be cooped up and kept and confined away from friends and family they want to get out and they want to innovate and create and engage and so i'm really looking forward to talking with people moving forward and seeing what the eurasia center can do to help um, grow and develop personally and also professionally especially in the state of hawaii which i'm so fond of having been born and raised yes yes well it's a aloha time now for us and we'll have to wrap it up so thank you to our guest ralph e winnie jr esquire for this information um, and these ideas about how the eurasian center is a resource for the world but it's also a resource for our state and uh, and and now to know uh, you know about the way it it's, it goes forward to move, to have an impact internationally. Um, that's also some learning that's that's very helpful. So I'm your host Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Uh, this is the program on Think Tech, the state of the state of Hawaii. And I'll see you next time. Mahalo everyone for watching. <laughs>